I wish to thank the Rajanat, Rajaratnam School of International Studies for inviting me to Singapore and giving me the opportunity to address you today. In my presentation, I will briefly speak about the historical background of the prohibition of chemical weapons, the conclusion of the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1992, and the achievements of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, or PCW, in short. I will then elaborate on the uses of toxic chemicals as weapons over the past few years, particularly in Syria, and efforts to prevent further uses. There have been several attempts to ban the chemical weapons. In 1899, the first peace conference in The Hague agreed to prohibit the use of poison in warfare. The second conference in 1907 confirmed this decision. However, this did not prevent the extensive use of chemical weapons during the First World War. In 1915, chlorine, then phosgene, were used. In 1917, sulfur mustard was discovered and used by all parties. Sulfur mustard affects the lungs, the skin, and the eyesight of human beings. The World War I was called the gas war. One million people were affected by the use of chemical weapons and 90,000 were um, uh, killed. If one day you visit the war museum in Ypres, Belgium, you will see a gruesome account of the consequences of the use of chemical weapons. This tragedy led the international community to make another effort in 1925 through the Geneva Protocol, which banned the use of biological and chemical weapons in armed conflicts. However, the protocol did not prohibit the production and stockpiling of such weapons. The countries involved in World War II produced huge amounts of chemical weapons, and they continued to do it for a while after the war. These were sophisticated weapons in terms of substances, including very little nerve agents, but also their delivery means. Mortars, artillery shells, aerial bombs, and uh, including those specifically designed for that purpose. Fortunately, those weapons were not used during the Second War, World War War. Consequences would have been devastating. There are several speculations as to the reasons of that restraint. We don't know which one is correct. It may be a combination of all of them, but it's clear that the likelihood of retribution had played a certain deterring role. During the Cold War, the maintenance of chemical weapon stocks become, became increasingly costly, and the possessor states were convinced that those weapons could not be used anymore in warfare due to legal and moral barriers. Furthermore, the technological progress in protective means made those weapons much less effective uh, and um, uh, whereas the uh, conventional uh, weapons have become uh, more efficient uh, than before. All these factors led the international community to work for a total ban of chemical weapons, including their development and production. Hence, negotiations began at the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. They were initially slow and sometimes acrimonious. The use of chemical weapons by the Saddam regime uh, against Iran during the war, as well as to, against the civilians, Kurds, in 1987 and 1988, played a catalyst role and helped accelerate the pace of negotiations. The dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 positively contributed to this process. The Chemical Weapons Convention, or the CWC in short, concluded in 1992 was considered as one of the peace dividends in the aftermath of the Cold War. The CWC was opened to signature in January 1993 in Paris and entered into force in 1997. The OPCW Technical Secretariat in The Hague in the Netherlands that I had the privilege to lead for eight years from 2010 
till 2018, was tasked to oversee the implementation of the CWC. The priority was initially given to the destruction of stockpiles under the verification of the OPSW Secretariat. Eight countries, including Syria, declared chemical weapons. The biggest possessor states were the Russian Federation and the United States. The destruction of stockpiles took longer than it was foreseen. It was costly, time-consuming, and dangerous. Innovative technology was required to eliminate some of those weapons. Nevertheless, 97% of all stocks have so far been destroyed. <clears throat> the remaining weapons in two sites, sites in America, uh, Kentucky and Colorado, will be destroyed by 2023. We are very close to a global zero as far as declared chemical weapons are concerned. This success was in fact recognized as the mentioned earlier by the Nobel Peace Prize Committee in 2013. In view of this progress on the elimination of existing stocks of chemical weapons, the OPSW member states have decided to focus more on the prevention of their reemergence. They unanimously reiterated their commitment to not develop, produce, or use chemical weapons on several occasions. They issued a solemn declaration in 2015 in Ypres on the occasion of the centenary of the first extensive use of chemical weapons during the World War I. All this, however, didn't prevent the use of toxic chemicals as weapons in Syria, Iraq, Malaysia, and the United Kingdom over the past few years. The Ghouta incident near Damascus in August 2013, where sarin was used, was the most serious one and resulted in the death of approximately 1,500 people in a few hours. This incident triggered a process leading to the accession of Syria to the Chemical Weapons Convention. The Syrian accession took place in extraordinary circumstances. The foreign ministers of the Russian Federation and the United States met in Geneva amidst discussion on the Red Line, you will remember, and agreed in four days on a framework document. Based on this, a decision was taken by the OPSW on 27 September 2013, and the UN Security Council endorsed this decision the same day in New York. The destruction of declared stocks and production facilities by Syria went relatively smoothly under the verification of the OPSW. During this phase, the US and Russia closely cooperated, the European Union and third, over, third, over than 30 uh, member countries contributed to these efforts either materially or uh, financially. However, the situation changed in spring 2014 when repeated allegations of use were reported and when it became clear that the Syrian declaration had several gaps and inconsistencies. In retrospect, I think that Syria should have been subject to further scrutiny before it became a full member and its compliance with its obligations should have been tested before it was treated like an equal member. In response to allegations of use, we established the fact-finding mission, the FFM. The FFM examined more than 80 reported incidents, mostly of chlorine use, and confirmed the use in 20 of them. The first FFM team was deployed in May 2014 to Damascus. On 27th May, the team came under attack on its way to Kafr Zita to investigate a reported incident. An armored vehicle was totally destroyed and a few of the team members lightly injured. The attempt by an unknown armed group to take them hostage was foiled by the arrival of the opposition group with which arrangements were made prior to the visit. Following this incident, the FFM had to conduct the investigations from neighboring countries, from outside of Syria. The expert teams interviewed victims, collected biomedical samples, and um, environment, some environmental samples from the sites of incidents were received through the facilitation of NGOs. 
OPCW experts were well trained and ran their activities very professionally. Their methods and procedures were reliable. The FFN's mandate was confined to determining whether chemical weapons were used or not. The teams confirmed the users but didn't attempt to identify the perpetrators. This was beyond their mandate. The work of the FFM was appreciated by a clear majority of OPCW member countries. Nevertheless, Syria and its supporters contested the results of investigations and questioned the working methods. These countries characterized the NGOs facilitating the FFM work as terrorists and accused the OPCW experts of not being impartial. This position of pro-Syrian countries had become increasingly categorical. A large group of members, though, preferred to remain neutral. They didn't want to take side between two groups, one led by Western countries, the other by Russia. Some of the neutral countries suggest that the OPCW Secretariat should act in a more balanced way in order to avoid political divisions. We had to explain that the OPCW work was technical, not political, and the findings were science-based and straightforward. In other words, there was no room for political maneuvering. The FFM still continues to investigate a number of reported incidents in Syria. Following the confirmation of the uh, chemical weapons attacks in Syria by an independent mechanism of investigation, the international community agreed on the need to identify those who were responsible. In August 2015, the UN Security Council unanimously adopted a resolution for the establishment of an OPCW UN joint investigative mechanism, which is called Jim in short. The Russian Federation went along with this, 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 this resolution. Jim has deepened the investigations on the incidents confirmed by the FFM. It concluded that the Syrian government was responsible of four uses and ISIS of two other incidents. These results were rejected by Syria and its allies. Heated debates took place both at the OPCW and the UN Security Council. In late 2017, the mandate of Jim was not extended by the UN Security Council because of the Russian veto. In fact, Russia hardened its position following its military involvement in Syria <clears throat> as of September 2015 and protected the Syrian government in international fora. In view of the deadlock at the UN Security Council, the French government launched the International Partnership Against Impunity Initiative in January 2018. This initiative, though welcomed by many, could not be a substitute for an attribution mechanism. As Director General of the OPCW, I made several statements at that time and drew attention to this gap. <clears throat> I argued that if no action was taken to fill the gap, a permanent damage could be inflicted upon the CWC regime, and I suggested that the OPCW Secretariat could do the job if it was given a mandate. In June 2018, the Conference of States Parties of the OPCW, which, which met on an extraordinary session in The Hague, adopted a decision requesting the Director General to make the necessary arrangements for identifying the perpetrators of chemical attacks. The OPCW investigation and identification team established by my successor is now active, even though Syria and its allies continue to question its legitimacy. I always believed that international mechanisms of accountability for violations of international law would be the best means of deterrence to prevent further crimes. If the FFM and Jim were not established, the use of chemical weapons could have been more widespread in Syria and the consequences could be horrendous. An essential requirement for the OPCW work in Syria was a solid analytical capacity. The OPCW laboratory and the network of designated labs in member countries 
played a significant role in the analysis of samples for the investigation of reported attacks and for the verification of Syrian declaration. The network, established at an early stage of the OPSW, was extended to cover labs analyzing the biomedical samples in addition to environmental ones. More than 1,000 environmental and biomedical samples from Syria were analyzed by these laboratories. The OPSW, though, never revealed which lab analyzed which samples, so this remains confidential. The same mechanism was used during the Salisbury incident, and results confirmed those of the UK authorities. Malaysia only requested some technical material to conduct its own investigation in February 2017. The DSO laboratories in Singapore are part of the OPSW network of 23 labs in 18 member countries. In spite of confirmed uses of chemical weapons in Syria, no one, neither a state nor a non-state actor, claimed responsibility. The ISIS, which extensively publicized the atrocities it committed in Syria and Iraq, never acknowledged that it used toxic chemicals. The actors of those crimes probably realized that chemical attacks were politically, legally, and morally unacceptable. Hence, the taboo against chemical weapons seems to be, remain intact. The question is, however, how to strengthen the int the international norm and deter further uses. The surveys carried out by experts dealing with criminal law suggest that the certainty of punishment, rather than its severity, would more effectively deter further crimes. In the case of chemical weapons attacks in Syria or elsewhere, if those who gave orders or, or personally executed them knew that they would be one day held accountable for their crimes, they would probably think twice before acting in such a way. The OPSW Secretariat continues to monitor the reported incidents of chemical attacks. There is a situation center which is operational 24 seven and promptly analyzes the reports of use. The experts determine whether they are credible or not. Since the OPSW has no independent means of gathering information, it relies on news agencies, social media, and of course, member states. The situation center work is preliminary, but crucial. A rapid response assistance mission, composed of experts who are able to identify the agent allegedly used and provide assistance to treat the victims and decontaminate the area, is ready to be deployed within 24 hours. The same team could also help the concerned country upon its request to investigate the incident and identify the origin of the chemical weapons. The OPSW Secretary doesn't need a decision by member countries before deploying this recently established team, but it will, of course, have to report back after the mission is over. In view of the OPSW's experience, over the past 22 years and drawing lessons from the recent developments, I want to share some thoughts on additional measures that might be taken to mitigate the risks of chemical attacks. Firstly, the member countries of the OPSW should fully implement the convention. The necessary legislation has to be developed and enacted uh, at domestic level. Declarations to the OPSW Secretariat should be on time and accurate. The chemical industrial activities should be monitored. Supply chains of especially sensitive chemicals should be controlled. In spite of significant progress, the national implementation still needs to be improved in several countries. Inspections conducted by the OPSW can only be complementary to domestic measures. The verification mechanisms at national and international level do not only ensure a certain order and discipline, but also raise awareness about security risks associated with the daily activities of chemistry practitioners. In 1995, the Chemical Weapons Convention was not yet implemented when Aum Shinrikyo uh, attacked, uh, conducted some chemical weapons attacks in, in Japan. 
the relevant authorities in this country were still in the process of organizing themselves for the domestic implementation of the Chemical Weapons Commission. As a result of attacks, several people were killed and the whole city was paralyzed because of the panic. In retrospect, the Japanese authorities reckoned that those attacks could perhaps have been prevented if the Chemical Weapons Convention related arrangements were already set in motion. Secondly, it's important that the law enforcement agencies are well trained and alert. They should be well equipped. They need to be supported by requisite technical means, particularly analytical capabilities. During my tenure as DG, I visited a number of member states and observed that many of them do not possess such assets. The OPSW is providing training for experts and facilitating the donation of equipment by some developed countries. Thirdly, the OPSW means and capabilities should be enhanced. The project of upgrading the existing laboratory in The Hague and turning it into its chemical and technical uh, chemical and te te technological center that I initiated before I left is moving ahead. The new center will not only have additional analytical capabilities, but it will also provide support to national labs and train experts from member countries. Moreover, it's planned to, to conduct research activities with the participation of national experts. Expertise on chemical weapons is becoming scarce the OPSW needs to be provided with sufficient resources in order to remain a repository of knowledge and expertise in the field of chemical weapons. As an independent body, its work should be trustworthy. Fourthly, cooperation between national and international law enforcement agencies, customs authorities, as well as relevant technical bodies is essential for prevention, in particular, of chemical terrorism. The most effective way would be to develop a systematic cooperation through regional organization, regional or sub-regional organizations. This will enable to save resources and enhance efficacy. For instance, I was pleased to learn that the ASEAN countries are now cooperating more closely in countering CBR threats. Similar arrangements already exist within NATO and the European Union. The other regions could emulate such practices. The proliferation risks are global and transboundary. We cannot afford having loopholes in certain parts of the world. This situation may adversely affect the security of other countries or regions. In the same way, we need to achieve the universality of the Chemical Weapons Convention along with other non-proliferation and disarmament instruments. The CWC has now 193 states parties. Four countries, namely Egypt, North Korea, Israel, and South Sudan, are not yet party to the Commission. They should join the OPSW without delay and condition. There is no justification for any country with, uh, to stay away from such commitments. Moreover, according to lawyers, the CWC is now part of the international customary law, and any country which, which would attempt to, to use chemical weapons would be held accountable, even if they are not party to the Convention. Efforts for prevention should go hand in hand with measures for response. In this regard, cooperation between relevant international organizations would be valuable. The OPSW organized tabletop exercises with representatives of other institutions to collectively prepare for response uh, against a terrorist chemical attack. Again, in terms of prevention, there is a need to work more closely with the civil society. The scientific and industrial communities, as well as educational institutions, should be further engaged to increase awareness about the risks of proliferation in regard to toxic chemicals, precursors, or dual-use chemicals. Access to knowledge or materials must be controlled. The OPSW stepped up its efforts in this regard. It established two years ago an advisory board on education and outreach, and it's conducting several programs in cooperation with other stakeholders. 
Having mentioned some possible measures to be taken individually by states or in cooperation with others, as well as by international organizations, I still believe that the most effective way, way for prevention would be deterrence. The certainty about accountability would help change the mind of potential users. Therefore, all available mechanisms to that end must be fully used, and if there are gaps, they should be filled. Identification of actors of chemical attacks is important, but not sufficient. Those who are responsible need to be brought to justice. At present, there is no international legal instance which could be activated for that purpose. The International Criminal Court in The, in the Hague has no jurisdiction over the crimes committed in Syria. The ICC, in short, needs to be specifically mandated by the UN Security Council to act. It is unrealistic, however, to expect that at present. Therefore, the only possible way seems to be seizing national courts, and there are signs that there is a move in this direction. Recently, I read that a court in Germany is, in fact, uh, preparing some in indictments for uh, senior Syrian officials, not for the use of chemical weapons, but for violations of uh, international humanitarian law. Before I conclude, I wish to emphasize the significance of the Chemical Weapons Convention as part of the rules-based international order. It is in the interest of the international community to uphold the integrity and credibility of the Chemical Weapons Convention regime for the well-being and security of our peoples. I thank you for your attention.